After that magnificent introduction, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> but I would like to congratulate James Garagnon in, on founding the von Mises Society at a time when the ideas of economic liberalism have been subjected to sustained assault even in the British Conservative Party. Under Margaret Thatcher, I was asked one day at number 10 to prepare an index of her books on economics. And she had a huge shelf of books, probably two or 300 of them on economics. And there were several by von Mises and of course Friedrich August from von Hayek, whom I met, and many of the other great economists who believe that free markets work better than managed markets for the simple reason that the sum of the individual wisdom of each person deciding how to spend his or her money is far more powerful than any central authority such as the state deciding in its infinite unwisdom how to spend it for them. And seeing how intensely Margaret Thatcher had read every line of every book and had marked it and learnt it and inwardly digested it, she was probably the best economically prepared Prime Minister we had ever had. And it showed in the economic performance of the country which had been languishing near the bottom of the Western Countries League and ended up very near the top. So the sort of economics advocated by von Mises works. And one imagines that he would have been horrified by the notion that the state should decide that yes, you can have windmills, and yes, you can have solar panels, but no, you can't have coal-fired power stations. Coal, the material on which the entire Industrial Revolution was built. And that kind of gross interference <coughs> is now beginning to show through in the very grave cost of our having done away with a diversity of energy generation. We're now down to pretty much nothing but gas because when the wind goes down and the sun goes down and any sailor in the room will know that those two tend to happen most evenings, then you have to rely upon thermal generation for a hundred percent of your power. So every time you add windmills or solar panels to the grid, it is not necessary to the grid. It is simply a feel-good factor for those who think that they're being green. But the crippling cost is only now becoming apparent. And it's all very well for us in the prosperous surroundings of an Oxford college to think that the mere workers and shopkeepers of our nation of shopkeepers don't matter. And if they're going to be poor, well, that's tough luck because we'll be all right. And that really is the approach of the Greens. It's not the approach, I hope, of anybody here. But to give you one example of a sub-postmistress just last week who got hold of her local newspaper and it eventually made the national press, she said, last year I paid £7,000 in energy costs for my little village post office and shop. Next year I have been told it will be 56 thousand pounds, eight times as much. And I won't be paying that because there will no longer be a village shop. And that is going to happen right across Britain unless and until our governing class, our class politique, as the French contemptuously and appropriately describe it, learns to wake up and smell the coffee and realise that you have to balance the costs of feeling good about saving the planet, which actually doesn't need to be saved, as I shall show, and the benefits, little as they shall be, as I shall also show, if even if the whole world 
were to succeed in going in a straight line from here to net zero emissions by 2050, which will not happen. So the subject of my talk, therefore, is the uneconomics of net zero. And the whole thing will be done on the back of this envelope that you see on the screen in front of you. Now, what do I press to make this happen? Uh, should I try? Yeah. So the first question that we should ask if we were being rational rather than emotional about this, and although von Mises understood the power of emotion and often the economic effect of it, the fact is it is necessary to try, particularly if you are in or around government, and trying to make sure that village post offices don't have to close because of an entirely foreseeable, but by the governing class unforeseen, consequence of their ludicrous policies to address global warming, you have to ask <coughs> rational questions. And the first of four questions we're going to ask this evening is do we really need to abate global warming anyway? And the answer of two-thirds of you in this room, because I took a poll before we started, is yes, we do need to abate it anyway. Would anyone who is here like to give me the main reason why they think that should happen? No. The, you, answer, the reason I put my hand up is because maybe we do, but I wouldn't argue for it. I'm, I'm sceptic. Maybe many of Right. Are so is there anyone here who can give a reason why we need to do this? Sir? So, as a physicist, when CO2 goes up, there's a direct kind of impact on the temperature in the long term, right? So if the temperature of the whole world goes up by a certain amount, certain tipping points can emerge. First of all, acceleration of you know, glaciers melting, for example, at the North Pole, if the ice melts away, the green patches will show, then the heating will go even faster, that will accelerate. And you've also got ocean acidification. For example, once the CO2 levels go up in the atmosphere, the CO2 levels will go up in the water, fish will die, coral will die, that's bad for biodiversity. And then sea, sea levels will rise, obviously, which is bad. Um, and lastly, you get non-linear effects, for example, um, the stream, I can't quite remember the name, changing directions of where it flows. The thermohaline circulation? No. Um, can't quite think jet of stream. the jet stream. Oh, the jet stream, right, jet okay, stream. up in the atmosphere, right. Um, and that would change direction, and then you get places like Scotland, who usually enjoy a fairly mild climate, will actually be a lot colder than before. Right. But how much of that is actually happening? Well, to be honest, I, I'm not currently doing research in that, so I don't have mm. enough information. Well, we're going to look at some of these assertions, not all of the ones you mentioned, but some of them. So we're going to ask this question, do we need to do it anyway? And the reason why we might need to do it is that um, there are those who say, I'm going to a, a very smart conference at the Dorchester Hotel in London next week to be the negative reference group in a four-day conference. Ten minutes, and that's me, will be devoted to giving the other side of the case. And this is the proposition on the basis of which Saudi princes and captains of industry and finance and government from all over the world are going to be assembled at that Swank Hotel. The, the propaganda for this, this forum says that nothing can be regarded as a more existential threat than climate change. Well, I can think of one rather obvious existential threat which has killed, according to The Economist, some 25 million people just in the last two years. And that is, of course, the Chinese virus. So no, there are plenty of real existential threats. And had we spent a little more on those, and a little less on what I shall show to be the non-existential threat of climate change, then we wouldn't be in the economic mess that we're in now. And let me... First of all, say there is support for the catastrophist position in the peer-reviewed literature. Here is a paper from Environmental Research Letters in 2013 by researchers from the University of Queensland. And they said that they had reviewed, bless their little cotton socks, 11,944 papers on uh, climate science and related topics. And that they said that 97.1% percent of those papers had explicitly in terms endorsed the proposition 
that global warming is chiefly anthropogenic, so in those days they used the word man-made. And that was their statement of the consensus proposition. There in red, global warming is chiefly anthropogenic. But it doesn't say a word about tipping points or ice disappearing or things being dangerous. It, the only thing the consensus proposition actually says, according to this paper, which is the largest sample of its kind ever conducted, is that global warming is chiefly anthropogenic. But let us look a little bit further into this paper, which received enormous publicity. For instance, uh, sorry, how can I go back on this? Let me try that. Um, Mr. Obama, on his Twitter feed, when that paper of 2013 came out, said 97% of scientists agree <coughs> global warming is real, man-made, and dangerous. But you've just seen the definition of the consensus position on the previous slide. Not a word about danger in it. And this is the bait and switch by which the political forces behind this, which I will talk a little bit more about later, have managed to convince a lot of people who frankly ought to know better that global warming is a, is a, is a threat, when in fact it's very likely to prove to be a net benefit. Now let us look at this paper a little bit in more detail. Here is a paper published later that year in the Journal of Science and Education, after peer review, by Lee Gates et al. And I must confess that I was not only one of the authors of this paper, but I also did the counting and reading of the 11,944 papers to find out what had really happened. And I discovered that the authors of the original paper from Australia had themselves listed only 65 papers, or 0.5% of the original 11,944, as having explicitly endorsed the consensus position. Well, we then read all 64 of those papers, or 65, and we found that only 41, or 0.3%, not 97.1%, 0.3%, had actually endorsed even that milquetoast consensus proposition that global warming of recent decades was mostly man-made. Now, how many of you have seen this paper and its result reported in any mainstream news medium anywhere. I see no hands. Now, given the intensity of the debate about global warming, is it not interesting that the paper saying that 97.1% of scientists had said they supported the consensus position was widely reported and it was mentioned by ministers in the British Parliament and in many other parliaments. It was mentioned by Mr. Obama in his Twitter feed. Nobody mentioned this result because we went and did what scientists, sir, are supposed to do. We did not simply believe the propaganda. We went and checked meticulously and boringly. I had to write a computer program to read down their list of the papers because it was in comma delimited format, which is extremely irritating. And once I'd done that, and I got this result, 64 or 65 papers, I thought I'd programmed it wrong. So then I had to do it again, this time using the search function in the form of Microsoft Word that deals with text files, which is called Notepad. And I had to go through by hand and check it by hand, and it came out the same. Now, anybody could have done that, but it was only we who did it. And when we had done it and reported it, nobody in the mainstream news media wanted to know. <coughs> and that should concern us all, because what it means is that freedom of speech is being shut down. And you cannot have a proper academic discussion on matters like this if a result as appallingly, deliberately bad as that can be publicised everywhere and the correction to it that you see on the screen now doesn't get any coverage at all. <coughs> Wait a minute. Now, a citizen of Queensland was deeply upset when he saw Lee Gates et al. and realised what Cook et al. had done. So he went to Queensland police and he swore out a complaint 
saying that the perpetrators of the original paper had, in issuing that paper, also perpetrated a fraud. They had made money for themselves as researchers by pretending to do research showing this 97.1% consensus when their own data, their own data file, which I made them produce, it took me three weeks to get it from them, showed that actually they had themselves counted only 0.3%. And the Queensland police investigated and they reported back to that citizen that a deception had occurred. But the social scientist concerned who'd written this paper had by then left Australia, and so there was nothing they could do. They also said they would have found it difficult to quantify the sheer magnitude of the damage done to people's pockets by the belief engendered by this paper that there really was a scientific consensus which does not, in fact, exist. How many of you have seen in any mainstream news medium any report of Queensland Police's finding about Cook et al. 2013. I see no hands. So is it really the existential threat that we're told it is? Well, the simplest way to find out is to go to the people who actually keep the data on how many people are dying because of bad weather worldwide. And you'll see that the number of people dying from general national, natural disaster deaths at red along the bottom here, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes and such, has remained more or less constant, even though the population of the world has roughly tripled over the period of this graph. But look what's happened to the blue line, the annual climate-related deaths. It has plummeted. And it's a tiny, tiny fraction. That little star at the right-hand end in blue, that's the 2020 figure. That's the most recent figure those data, data sets will produce. And that is what's actually happening. And why do we think it is? Does anybody think of a reason why it is that warmer weather should actually not prove to be catastrophic, but actually a very good thing for life on this planet? Can anybody think of a reason? Which again, Yes, sir. Very good point, yes. And how do we know that? Because we can tell from satellites which have microwave sounding units on them that they can look down and they can look for what is known as the chlorophyll fluorescence of the green matter on Earth, trees and plants everywhere. And we'll come to that a bit later on because I've got a slide on that and it's very interesting. But the main reason why people are dying an awful lot less even though there are various uh, extreme weather events that still happen, is that, as we'll see later, there hasn't really been much of an increase in extreme weather events, except perhaps for a little bit more in the way of heat waves, but there's been fewer forest fires. Uh, the average intensity, duration and frequency of hurricanes and tropical cyclones generally is much as it was 40 years ago. There's no real trend. And so it is with virtually all the indicators. But the most important indicator of whether you're going to die of weather is whether it's cold or hot. And which do you think kills more people? The answer is cold weather, of course. But again, in this presentation, I'm not asking you to take anything from me because the way science works is we look at the facts. We integrate from different places the data, and then we draw conclusions. We do not start with a politically dictated conclusion and then seek to justify it by uttering some tedious party line. So let's have a look at de deaths from heat against deaths from cold. Blue is for cold, red is for heat. This was a paper in The Lancet just a few years ago. And as you will see, in most regions of the world, in fact, in all regions of the world, you're far more likely to die from cold than in heat. And even a hot place like Africa, 1.2 million people a year on average die from cold, 30,000 from heat. So what is the conclusion from that? If you were to let the planet warm up by another one, two or even three degrees, I was discussing this with the world's most eminent climatologist the other day, he said if there were three degrees more warming, there'd be more people alive at the end of the century than if there was not any warming. 
you know, this really isn't actually a problem. So there is the hard evidence, but how many of you have seen that fact reported in any mainstream news media? I see no hands. And here, sir, is, is your point, and quite right, your correct point, about uh, the chlorophyll fluorescence, which has led to an increase, which is actually a staggering increase. It's very nearly 30% in some authorities, 15% I think is the kind of average in most authorities, in just the last 30 or 40 years, in the net primary productivity of plants and trees, which means how much green biomass is there? Now you have all seen reports in the newspapers about just how many uh, trees are being cut down and we're destroying the green biomass of the planet. But this is what the satellites actually show. Yes, in Brazil and in some of the Central American countries there is deforestation and it shows. But the overall picture is a great deal better than that. But how many of you have seen that fact reported in any mainstream news medium? I see no hand. And here are crop yields. Now this is a very important slide. If we care, as I put it to you, we should, about the people who are still starving, thank goodness the number has been declining very, very rapidly, particularly over the last 50 years. Poverty is something that is it's now within our grasp to wipe out. And let's look at the global land area under cereal production. That's rice and grains and corn and, and wheat and so forth. And that's been more or less constant in the last 60 years. But look at the growth in the yield of cereal crops from exactly or pretty much exactly the same land area over 60 years. Now I'm not going to tell you as I would with the previous slide that CO2 is the chief agent of this particular slide. It was on the previous slide with the chlorophyll um, fertilization for, for perfectly good reason. CO2 is essential to photosynthesis. But here, CO2's increase is a contributor to the increase in productivity, which uh, arises, for instance, from mechanization, from fertilization using artificial fertilizers, but also to some degree from the additional CO2 in the atmosphere. But how many of you have seen that fact from the Food and Agriculture Organization reported in any? Mainstream news medium. I see no hands. Oh, sir, you have seen it. Well, I've read in um, a book, The Climate Casino, effectively between zero and three degrees, a bit, a slight increase will actually increase overall um, crop yields. But once you get to three, four degrees, it goes the other way and obviously it keeps going down after that. Right, you say obviously. Um, there, are, there are papers, as you know, very much in the other. Uh, direction, precisely because of the CO2 fertilization effect, which is not just contributing to the primary productivity of plants that the gentleman at the back so rightly pointed out, but it also drought proofs plants. So that where you get drought, if there's a higher CO2 concentration, the plants do not have to have so many stomata under their leaves and they can therefore breathe in the CO2. CO2 is plant food, so they need to breathe it in. And if they have fewer stomata, it's the stomata through which they lose moisture. And with more CO2 in the air, fewer stomata, in all the dry countries, the plants will grow much more easily. And as far back as 1981, Nicholson et al. reported that the total land area of the southern Sahara, the Sahel, which had returned to the vegetation that had last been there 7,000 years ago, you're too young to remember, but at that time there was vegetation right across what is now the Sahara. And that has now come back on an area equivalent to 300,000 square kilometres, and that was by 1981. I haven't seen a recent figure, but I wouldn't be at all surprised to find if it was more. So again, it's not a question of just believing the party line. One must look at the evidence on all sides and weigh it up properly. So then polar bears, oh the great picture book 
storyline is that polar bears are under threat. So Dr. Susan Crockford of the University of Victoria decided to go and count them as best she could using a variety of methods from flying over it to satellite imagery to tagging polar bears to see where they went and then following them to find the groups they were with. And she is probably the world's ranking expert on this. And her conclusion is that there are now something like two and a half times as many polar bears, there's some uncertainty, but it's certainly a lot more than there were in 1960, and seven times approximately as many as there were in the 1940s. Now what has accounted for this commendable result? The real risk to polar bears has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the weather. Who knows where polar bears came from? Where did I come from, Daddy? I'll tell you where polar bears came from. They came from the land. They were brown bears originally. And then they took to finding that seal blubber was a cracking good source of nutrition. And so, because fat, of course, is the primary nutrition for mammals, so they began going out onto the ice and then they needed to hide themselves from the seals. And so by evolutionary adaptation, they became white. And the way they, they make their fur white is in itself the subject of countless papers because it's very, very interesting. But if the worst that would happen, if the whole of the Arctic melted, which, by the way, we were told confidently by Al Gore, I was there in 2007 when he said it in Bali, he said by 2013 all the ice in the Arctic will be gone by the summer. And there's very little sign of that happening. And we're not 2013, we're coming up to 2023. So just plucking figures out of the air and inventing future scenarios that have no scientific basis is contemptible. What you should do is start by finding out the facts, as Dr. Crockford did. And what happened then was that the University of Victoria dismissed her because her result was inconsistent with the Communist Party line on the climate. That also happened to Dr. Peter Ridd when he was chucked out of one of the universities in the Antipodes because he, had, he was one of the world's greatest experts on the Great Barrier Reef and he said actually it's doing fine and I can confirm this because my brother and his three strapping lads used to go swimming and, and snorkeling there and they said it was all looking okay. But Peter Ridd was mercilessly hounded out by his university and there were several court cases and in the end the courts actually decided in favour of the university. So it's fine, he shouldn't be pointing out that his colleagues have got things wrong. That's not what science does these days. It was an extraordinary <coughs> finding. But she was also pushed out of her university simply for reporting what as best she could make it were the objective facts about polar bears. But I bet you haven't seen that fact reported in any mainstream news media. Oh, there's one or two who have. Good. Well, just perhaps the truth is beginning to penetrate. You're literally citing a blog post that's been completely defunct, what you're saying. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, but she has also done a series of papers on it. So, because uh, in fact, that graph, you say that was a blog post? Yeah. No, it wasn't, because it was I who did that graph from her data. So, uh, here is the um, IPCC, IPCAC the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, founded by a former Canadian oil magnate who was a communist and decided to make his home in communist China, from where he persuaded the UN to establish the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And here, and this is from a document of the Intergovernmental on Climate Change in 2013, are what they have had to do to adjust their sea level predictions, one of the points you raised, sir. They have had to relentlessly bring them down and down and down and down. And the late Tom Weissmuller, in the last paper he wrote before he died, had done a meticulous search of sea level rise in all parts of the world by multiple methods. He had also allowed for variability in isostatic recovery of the sea floor following the last ice age and had balanced the two off. And he found that sea level everywhere is rising at approximately one millimetre 
per decade. You're looking at very, very small uh, amounts of sea level rise. So then we come to global warming. That's what it's all about. But there hasn't been any for eight years. And this is the data set of the University of Alabama at Huntsville. And of course, you may say, oh, but you've cherry picked it by choosing only one data set. Well, if I had chose, chosen the Hadcrute 4 data set, Hadcrute 5 data set, I'm sorry, they've just updated it, um, then that make that nine years without any global warming at all. How many people have seen that fact reported in any mainstream news media? One. But here is what happens if we start trying to play God and say to third world countries in a new form of colonialism and imperialism, you can't have the coal-fired power stations that gave us cheap, secure, reliable, easily maintainable, affordable, and these days surprisingly clean electricity by coal-fired power. Because at the instance of a single communist-led environmental front group, all these institutions, in the end including to our undying shame, the British government, have decided they will no longer lend to third world countries for the desperately needed coal-fired power that they need to get themselves out of the Stone Age and into the 21st century. And I find this contemptible, that they should yield to pressure groups without having bothered to check any of the science and economics that we're going to see here. This is the consequence of not allowing Africa to have the electricity that we enjoy. Now, North is on the left here because our satellite corrects, as you will see, for the distortion that normally arises from using the Mercator projection. And so you see just how big Africa is in relation to Southern Europe, as all we could fit in on this frame. And you can see that it really is still almost entirely, literally, the dark continent. And that has consequences, consequences for the people who most need our help to catch up with us and enjoy the comfort, the prosperity, the warmth and the heating and the cooling and the air conditioning that we have until now been able to take for granted, though for how much long, longer I can't tell. Europeans live 80 years and we have a global average IQ, it's about 100. Africans live 65 years, and their IQ on average is two standard deviations below ours. But if they come to the West, then already there's a process which is fascinating the epidemiological statisticians and the, and the psychologists. Gradually, the Africans who come here their IQ goes up. It's already at 85, one standard deviation below ours. And I'm hoping, praying, that if we don't make Europe go dark as well, then the African average intelligence of those who come to Europe will be the same as ours. And I'm also hoping that if we can overcome the vicious prejudice and entirely irrational prejudice against burning coal, which currently exists among the global class politique, then we can light up Africa too and see their intelligence come up to the global average. And if you think I'm in any way intending in saying this to be contemptuous of the intelligence of those from the continent where human life originated, I am not for this reason. There are one or two people of Chinese origin in this room. The average intelligence of anyone from China, particularly if they are <coughs> Han Chinese, is one standard deviation above ours. And if you go back in the history of intelligence to the time when Homo neanderthalensis was interbreeding with Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, for physiological reasons, had an advantage of one standard deviation in intelligence over Homo neanderthalensis. And look what happened to Homo neanderthalensis. So it is in the interest of all of us that everybody's intelligence should be levelled up to that of the Han Chinese. For otherwise, 
it will be the Han Chinese that will inherit the earth. Intelligence is the most powerful predictor, other than diligence, of success in life. But let us now move to the idea of doing something about global warming. Two-thirds of you, until I began speaking, thought we needed to do something about global warming. Well, here is what has happened. We've had now 26 conferences of the states parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The last one was in Glasgow last year. And they have been plotted by Jennifer Mahorosy here on a graph showing the change in CO2 concentration over the same period. All those talks, all that chattering, all those various elaborate promises, all those trillions squandered, and there is absolutely no flicker of a downturn in the CO2 trend. So that graph should worry those who think we've got to do something about climate change because it suggests that the trillions we've already spent have achieved nothing. And I'm going to show you exactly why they have achieved nothing at the end of these slides. <coughs> now, why is it then that we're achieving nothing? The first and most obvious proximate reason is that coal consumption, natural gas consumption and oil consumption are all increasing and have been increasing pretty much throughout the last 30 years. You can see the, um, a couple of dips there, the 2008 financial crash, the Covid there made little dents in the lines, but otherwise they are relentlessly upwards. But how can this be? We've shut down all our coal-fired power stations. We've shut down our nuclear power stations. How can all this be going up? Well, let's find out. This is why 70% of primary of contribution to primary net energy growth in recent years have come from <coughs> nations who, because of the way the Paris and related climate treaties are drafted, are entirely exempt from any obligation, legal, moral or other, to do anything whatsoever to abate their emissions and hence mitigate global warming. The entire burden of doing something about saving their planet, which frankly is not worried by our emissions of CO2 because the plants love it as we've seen, but it all falls chiefly on the Western countries, pretty much on the Western countries alone. And there is a reason for that, which I will come to after we've gone through the slides. So that's why we can't do anything about this, unless everybody does. What I shall show you is that even if everybody does, it ain't going to make much difference. Now, where did this extra coal consumption? Let's just take coal as one example. Well, there's been a huge expansion in coal-fired power use in India, China and occupied Tibet. Remember that China is a colonial power. She still unlawfully occupies that wonderfully fragrant uh, theo theo theocratic uh, kingdom of Tibet. And look at the coal consumption there. Well, how are we going to do anything about any of this, even if there were a problem about global warming, which we've seen there actually may not be, and we'll do some maths in a minute to show you why there isn't. But there's nothing we can do if China in particular is going to go on as it did last week or the week before, announcing another 43 2 gigawatt coal-fired power stations. And do you hear the environmental activists out on the streets protesting about China's vast increase in coal-fired power? I see no hands. No, you so don't. Why the banks aren't supposed to lend to coal in this project? I'm sorry? The activists are saying that this is a very convinced bank that they shouldn't lend to these yeah, Yes, but you see, China can, can do its own lending. That's why it's, bu it's building all these coal. It doesn't need to come to the Western <laughs> banks to do that. But nobody is saying anything about China burning extra coal. There is a reason for that, which I shall come to when we've gone through these slides. Arcelor Mittal, whose chairman Lakshmi Mittal, will be listening to my talk next week with more than usual interest, has had to close a blast furnace 
in Bremen for plate steel and his direct reduction plant at Hamburg because they can't afford the tenfold increase in gas and electricity prices, which of course arises chiefly from the global warming policies that have shut down competing forms of electricity generation. So they're utterly dependent on Siberian gas, which even now, even this far into the special military massacre in Ukraine, is six or seven times the price it was before the special military massacre began. There is a reason for that, which I shall explain to you after we've gone through these slides. So our second question is, were they correct about the science? Or did they, in fact, screw it up? And this is a question that you should ask. It's not a question saying, oh, the physicists say, or the scientists say, or 97% say. The question is, did they get it right or didn't they? Now, here is a very revealing statement by James Hansen, who in 1984, an appropriate year, concluded that there would be three or four times as much final warming for every one degree of warming from a doubling of CO2. And the reason why you get the extra warming is what's called feedback response, which somebody mentioned earlier. And so he's saying that it's a warming of four Celsius, and that means that if you start with one Celsius of direct warming by CO2, and it's one or thereby one or maybe a little bit more, then it becomes four because of feedback. Well, now, that is a priori very nearly impossible, and it's certainly fantastically implausible, but let's see a little bit more about this. You see, in 1850, the total greenhouse effect, which includes feedback response, was 27 Celsius. But the direct warming by the naturally occurring non-condensing greenhouse gases in that year was approximately 7.5 Celsius. Now, these are mainstream mid-range figures. We're going to confine it to that so as to keep this to a reasonable length. So you get a system gain factor of 3.6. You multiply just over 1 Celsius of direct warming by doubling CO2 by 3.6, and you're going to get kind of close to 4 Celsius. So that is consistent with what Hansen is saying. And here again, if we add the warming that we've caused since, assuming that we have caused it all, so now it's 28 Celsius total greenhouse effect, 8.3 Celsius direct warming by greenhouse gases. So the system gain factor, again, in that same ballpark of 3 to 4 that he originally said. So again, it looks so beautifully consistent, doesn't it? Here again, this is the IPCC in 2021. Now the models... The CMIP-6 models say that on average 3.9 Celsius warming, again that's with, within Hansen's bracket, per doubling of CO2, that's equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity, ECS, in response to 1.045 Celsius of reference or pre-feedback response climate sensitivity, 3.7. Now you see how neat this all looks, but there's just one problem with that, however internally self-consistent, it is inconsistent with what's going on in the real world. And in the real world, going back here to 1850, the sun was shining. I sometimes think that all climatologists must be Scottish because they hadn't realised the sun is shining, and therefore the vast majority of the feedback response at any given moment in the climate is feedback response to the fact that the sun is shining. So you have to correct that equation. Hansen didn't know this. And I have had huge arguments with numerous climatologists. They do not understand this. But I have several professors of control theory on my team, and they tell me that this is correct, that the feedback at any given moment, feedbacks that are in the system at that moment, must respond equally at that moment to all the components in the entire reference temperature and not just to the perturbation signal. So that means it's not, as we saw before, at 27 over 7.5, it's 260 plus 27 over 260 plus 7.5. Suddenly your system gain factor comes down to 1.077, 
not any longer somewhere between three and a half and four, but one, 0.077. Feedback's really not making very much difference at all. Now, we have to be clear about this. They will argue that all the previous instances were a, a what's called a differential system gain factor, which looks only at the effect on the entire climate by reference to the perturbation signal. Now, you can do that, but what is uncanny is that the reason why they thought it was of that order was because they'd forgotten the sun was shining. They stuck themselves with this idea of about three or four Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2, and then when they realized this was the case, they couldn't go back. They couldn't row back on what they'd previously said. This has given them a huge amount of difficulty. Well, now, don't take this from me. Let's look at the real world data. Now, here, if we apply the 1.077 system gain factor we've just calculated, this is the absolute system gain factor, which includes the fact that the sun is shining, which is surely observable in most parts of the world, then starting with the 1.045 Celsius reference doubled CO2 sensitivity, then you get a 1.1 Celsius equilibrium climate sensitivity. A word of warning. If we were to add just 1% to that 1.077, this would then become 4 Celsius, exactly as climatology says, because, of course, that 1% increase in the feedback uh, strength will impact not just the differential, but also the entire reference signal, which includes the sunshine. However, what we want to do then is check in the real world to see what has actually happened. And here we are. <coughs> uh, the CMIP6 models agree that there's been about, at mid-range, 3.5 watts per square meter of doubled CO2 <coughs> forcing. That's their figure. They say that's what it is. But the total forcing, including anthropogenic forcing, uh, for the whole of the, the period since 1850 is about the same. So if we were going to see three or four Celsius of warming as they had originally predicted in 1990, you would expect the temperature to be a whole lot higher than it actually is. You'd expect this to be certainly more like two and a half or three Celsius and not just fractionally over one. They could, couldn't even push it over one without redoing the whole data set because it was below one before they they'd switched the data set from head group four to head group five. So you can see what a mess they're in. Because it looks as though if this continues to be the case, we get just continuing gentle warming, then there is no particular change in the feedback regime compared with 1850. And that means that the amount of warming we can expect per doubling of CO2, or by the end of this century, because the forcings are about the same for those two things compared with now, then all we're going to see is one Celsius of warming by the end of this century. In fact, doing a more exact calculation, possibly as little as 0.9. Now, that is not an existential threat. It's a physical error which needs to be corrected. And as you can see, the ratio of predicted warming by now, since 1990, compared with the observed warming is 2.4. That's a pretty big error. And yet, they have made no adjustment to their predictions. They continue to predict three Celsius at mid-range, two to five Celsius. And the problem with that is that if you calculate back what the system gain factors would be, there's practically no difference between them. And what that means is that the models are entirely, and I mean entirely, incapable of telling us anything whatsoever about how little or how much global warming we may produce because we do not know feedback strength and hence the system gain factor to a sufficient precision to get it down to as narrow an interval as this. Now you see, this is actually quite elementary, first year undergraduate physics. So why is it that this has not been properly discussed anywhere? There's a reason for that, which I shall explain later. Question three, how much warming can we abate even if we had global net zero? 
Now, that is surely a sensible question, that those of you who think we should uh, go to net zero by 2050, again, about two-thirds in the room originally, how much warming can we abate, even if we actually get to global net zero? Would any of the physicists here like to tell me the answer to that? I see no hands, because, curiously, nobody seems to have worked it out. There's a reason for that, which we'll come to a little later. Now here is what has actually happened. Here are the components in anthropogenic greenhouse gas influence on temperature over the last 30 years or so, from 1990 to 2020. And as you'll see, it's gone up by one unit, and the units here are watts per square metre. And it's gone in a more or less perfect straight line, matching Jennifer Mahoris's graph, because for all the trillions spent, we've made no difference. That's the first thing you learn from this graph. The next thing you learn is that methane, they're now trying to kill off yet another Western industry, which is the cattle industry and the beef industry, which would have catastrophic um, effects on diabetes levels if they got away with it. But methane, virtually unchanged influence, even though there's more of it in the atmosphere, there's hardly any of it anyway. And so it doesn't make much difference to our effect on the climate. Indeed, all the other ones are basically much as they were. It's CO2 that has indeed increased, but it's increased by one unit over 30 years. So if we were to go in the next 30 years, from 2020 to 2050, in a straight line down to net <coughs> zero emissions, then how much of a unit would we abate? Well, the answer, of course, is half a unit of extra emissions that we won't have done because we've gone in a straight line from emitting what we're emitting now to, to zero. So half a unit would be abated. How many of you knew that it was as little as that? It's not a difficult calculation, now is it? It's one divided by two equals one half. It's as easy as that, but nobody had done that calculation. There is a reason for that, and I'll tell you why later. <coughs> so, let's put this on the back of our envelope. Now we're going to do the calculation. 30 years of man-made forcing, one unit abated, straight line to global net zero by 2050. We're not going to abate it all straight away. Then it will be one unit. We've got to get there in a straight line, and it is a straight line, we've seen that. So half a unit abated. So there we are. That goes on the back of our envelope, and we'll build this calculation up as we go. So how much warming would half a unit represent? Well, we can take 3 Celsius mid-range final warming by doubled CO2, divide that by 4 units forcing by doubled CO2, again mid-range. These are from IPCAC again. Uh, these are mainstream mid-range figures. 3 divided by 4 is 3 quarters of a Celsius per unit. So half a unit, gosh, you're going to be so surprised by this, is three-eighths of a Celsius degree. Now that is before we make any of the corrections we made to the physics earlier. Even if we accept every figure that is handed down to us from the Bible of the global warming panic merchants, the, even if the whole world went to net zero by 2050, three-eighths of a Celsius degree of warming is all that we could possibly abate. It is as little as that. But bear in mind that we saw earlier that two-thirds of the planet isn't going to do that. It's under no obligation to do it. So divide that by three, one-eighth of a Celsius degree. That would be what we would abate if the whole of the West, against which climate policies are selectively targeted, and deliberately targeted, one-eighth of a Celsius degree would be abated. Now, is that going to stop sea level rise, or is that going to stop killing polar bears or all the other imagined and imaginary disasters? Well, of course it isn't. It's too darn small. But that is the most that we can realistically expect to achieve. And this is straightforward, mid-range, methods and calculations, there is nothing 
unusual or surprising or dishonest or invented about this and every step is being put in front of you explicitly because that is how von Mises when he gave his lectures did it. Everything was spelled out for his students so that they could see for themselves and verify for themselves that what he was telling them was the truth. So our final question then, how much would worldwide net zero by 2050 cost us all? That too is a question we do actually have to ask because we've already seen we're not actually dealing with the catastrophe scenario. We've seen enough data already at the beginning of this presentation to establish that that simply isn't the case. Therefore it's not a question of saying we have to go onto a war footing, shut down all the economies of the West and still let the rest of the world go on burning coal and so forth in the hope that somehow that would save the planet. So how much would worldwide net zero by 2050 cost us all if the rest of the world acted uh, and committed economic harakiri in the way that the West has been inveigled into doing? Well, McKinsey and Company is the world's leading consultancy firm. And I used to go to them when I was at 10 Downing Street to ask about questions of this kind. And they always gave me proper data and properly researched answers. And they produced a report uh, about a couple of years ago saying that the cost of the whole world just in capital expenditure alone, that's what spending on physical assets means, is $275 trillion to go to global net zero. And that, they say, on its own, is equivalent to half of all global corporate profits. But now, suppose we bear in mind, as we should if we know anything about economics, that the current account cost is likely to be larger than the capital cost. But let us, and remember that post office, it's got a, an increase eightfold in its electricity bills. And that's fairly typical around Europe at the moment. But now, Let's suppose that we just add, we're going to be really generous to the numbers here, we just add 50% to the capital cost to get the capital and current account combined total cost of the world going to next net zero by 2050. And we'll do that sum now. It's 400,000 billion. It's 400 trillion. So let's put that on the graph. And if you divide, as you can see, um, three-eighths of a Celsius degree by 400,000 billion, then for every billion that you spend on trying to make global warming go away, and bear in mind we're still using mainstream mid-range figures here, one one millionth of a Celsius degree for every billion dollars of other people's money that you spend on making global warming go away. Now the reason I have taken such a time to explain this step by step in detail is that that gives you and anyone else who thinks that I'm just making this stuff up the opportunity to check the sources. There are three sources for this particular calculation, NOAA, Annual Greenhouse Gas Index, the IPCC 2021 pages 77 and 78 for the forcing and warming per double CO2 respectively and uh, McKinsey of course and we add 50% to the McKinsey figure to allow a token, absolutely minimal, uh, current account cost in, in addition to the capital cost of getting to net zero. And that's what you get. Less than a millionth of a Celsius degree for every one billion we spend on global warming. Now that's why I say that we can't do this anyway because you just don't get enough bang <coughs> for your buck. A small boy going into a sweetie shop standing outside and seeing candy canes in the window. He asks the same questions we have. How many candy canes do I want? Do I want them anyway? If I do want them, how many has he got? And how many can I get with this money? And he goes in and puts his sticky coins on the counter and says, gee miss, how many candy canes can I get for this? Now if a kid knows to ask that question, and if the entire academic community worldwide is not asking that question, and they're not asking it because if they did, they'd get this answer, this or thereby. It's not going to be much different from this. The question is, why are they not asking this question? 
and there's a reason for that. So let's now have a look at a corrected version of this. Here we have allowed for the error of physics I identified and explained earlier, and we therefore make an adjustment to take into account the actual rate of global warming rather than the predicted rate of global warming on which the previous graph was based. And we also take account of the fact that since McKinsey's issued that report a couple of years ago, there has been the special military massacre, and the prices of all the relevant commodities have gone up, up to tenfold. Most of the metals, Russia, after all, is a commodities economy. It produces all these metals, it produces gas, it produces oil, it produces grain. And it is making a fortune. Its economic advisors worked out that if it went to war, this is what would happen to all the price of the commodities it sells, and that Russia would be laughing all the way to the Moscow and Rodney Bank. Do you think they're taking so much of a time to mess around in Ukraine because they're incompetent, because Putin is gaga and doesn't know what he's doing? Yeah. One of the first rules that we learn when studying how to be good intelligence analysts is never, it's the first thing the lecturers always say to us, never, ever, ever underestimate the enemy. Never, ever, ever hold him in contempt because he may be smarter than you think. And I have some of the background to this and it's very, very interesting and we'll look at it in just a moment. But the conclusion, if you make those two adjustments, you correct for the actual amount of global warming that has happened and is observed to have happened and the mid-range estimate of that, and you correct by doubling McKinsey's cost, that's a very generous small amount of increase compared with two years ago. It's probably more like six or eight times minimum, but we'll just double it. One five millionth of a Celsius degree for each one billion dollars spent on trying to abate global warming. And that is a pretty horrifying set of conclusions. One seventh to three eighths of a Celsius degree of abatement if the whole world went to net zero. Divide those numbers by three if it's only the West. And even then, we're not going to make it. Total cost of achieving it, 400,000 to 800,000 billion. And all that buys for each billion spent one five millionth to one one millionth of a Celsius degree. And how many of you have seen any of those facts reported in any mainstream news medium? I see no hands. Well, that concludes the rather hard work that I wanted to put in front of you. And I could not do this to most audiences because they would not be able to take it. You've taken it very patiently. But I promised to join up some of the dots for you and explain why these nonsensical policies are being advocated, even in the face of calculations that you can literally put on the back of an envelope, which show what nonsense it all is and how there's absolutely no way that we can make any difference to the rate of global warming, even if we were the cause of it. Because however much we spend, there's only so much of the future warming that we can abate, even if the whole world tries. So we have to go back to 1945. And this is going to be 10 minutes of history, and then we're going to take questions. In 1945, the Allies hung back from invading the center of Berlin because they wanted to recognize the enormous capacity or, and bravery, I should say, of the Russian forces under their gallant and very competent commander, Marshal Zhukov. He had organized the resistance to the siege of Stalingrad. He had driven, as, as uh, the Russians had driven Napoleon out, he drove Hitler out. And they were our allies at that time, and we were grateful to them. And we wanted them to have the honor of capturing the Mitte district at the center of Berlin, where all the great Reich's ministries were, including in Mauerstraße, Wall Street, the largest office building then in Western Europe. And that was the Reichspropagandaamt of Joseph Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister. And we'd bombed one wing of it, but it was a huge building. It's still used today as the Ministry of Social Security, how times have changed. <laughs> and in the rest of the building, all the records were intact because Goebbels had 
believed his own propaganda about the Tausend Jahrisches Reich. We were going to go on for a thousand years. Don't destroy the records. These are historic records of how the Reich began. So they weren't destroyed. And the MGB, as it then was, the predecessor of the KGB, got the lot. And they were fascinated. How do we know? Because within one month, they had founded a new division, or as they call it, a directorate of the KGB, or the MGB as it then was. It was to become the KGB within a year or two. And that directorate was called the Desinformatia Directorate, the Disinformation Directorate. And the job of that directorate primarily was to attack the personal reputations of everyone anywhere in the world outside Russia, which they already controlled and didn't have to worry about, who was effective in speaking out against communism. And they had their reputations trashed. They, his first target was, of all saintly people, Pope Pius XII, who was made out to be a Nazi-loving Jew-hater. How do we know that that wasn't true? When I was at the Evening Standard 20 years ago, everybody thought it was true. We actually published an op-ed to my fury saying it was true. And I said, no, it isn't. And they said, how do you know? I said, because I've seen the intelligence papers and it's there's no truth in it. And to convince you that there is no truth in it, when the war was ended and the Germans had safely gone and it was safe to come out and do what you wanted to do, the chief rabbi of Rome and his deputy chief rabbi both became Catholics and the chief rabbi specifically requested and got the Pope as his sponsor at his baptism. But you won't have seen that fact reported in any mainstream news medium. Now we move rather rapidly forward to the 1960s when the Russians began to realise that communist economics actually really, really doesn't work. But they weren't prepared to give it up. So they decided in their unimaginative way that they would trash the Western economies instead. So they captured the leaderships, but not significantly the memberships, of the trade unions. And they concentrated chiefly on Britain because of our links with America, the Commonwealth and Europe. Those links are still substantially in place today, and they're very powerful links. So we were the chief target of the Disinformation Directorate's campaign to mess up the Western economies. If they could do it to us, they reckoned they could do it to anyone. So they began organising a series of strikes led by communist trade union leaders in various industries. <coughs> but then they realised that that didn't really seem to do very much damage. The free market is a remarkably self-correcting mechanism. You know, you can try and push it one way, but you're, you're pushing against the weight of the decisions of everyone who is operating freely in that market. And it's not easy to push against that. So they had to refine their tactics. So what they decided to do was to go after the West's energy supplies, specifically Britain's energy supplies. Now, Britain at that time, 70% of our electricity came from coal, the miners who are my personal heroes of labour, they dug the coal. They dug the darkness underground to bring men light. And if they could get the miners on strike, they could do serious economic damage. So they did. And Edward Heath's government fell in 1974 as a direct result of Soviet interference in our politics because they had trained Mr McGahey and his fellow communist leaders of the Mine Workers Union, and they were cleverer than Edward Heath's government was. However, I come into the picture now because in 1974, I was put alongside Scargill at a social lunch, just for a few mates, at Whitelock's pub in Leeds, a 16th century pub where they do really good ham and eggs and pretty good beer. And so I met Scargill there and we discussed what his aims were for the National Union of Mine Workers. And it was very clear to me that what he was intending to do was, of course, to have another strike the moment we had another uh, Conservative government. And so in due course, 
um, in 1978, just before Margaret Thatcher took office, something really interesting happened. The person who had, 32 years previously, in 1945, been appointed by the MGB as the head of the then new disinformation directorate, Lieutenant General Ion Mihai Pachepa, who had formerly been the head of the Securitate, the dreaded secret police in Ceausescu, <coughs> Romania, suddenly woke up one day and realized that everything he was doing was morally wrong. This was a most extraordinary event. It's very rare at senior levels in the intelligence services that anyone actually has a fit of morality, particularly the Russian one. But he suddenly realized, he woke up and he said, I'm not doing this. And so he, to our astonishment, approached our intelligence services and said, um, can I please defect? And so we said, where do we sign? And he came out to the West. And of course, he had to be hidden in very great secrecy. And he lived, married in America. I can't tell you where, for the good and sufficient reason that I don't know where. Because even I, who needed to know, had to go through a series of cutouts in order to ask him questions about the intentions of the miners, because I was moved into 10 Downing Street, ostensibly as a policy advisor, in 1982. We had expected the strike to begin in 1983, but the electrifyingly political effect of the victory of Margaret Thatcher over the Argentinian dictators in the Falklands War <coughs> meant that Moscow told Scargill that he had to wait for another year until that effect of the victory had worn off. So it was in 1984 that he started the miners' strike. But by then, we had taken a number of precautions dating back to the early 1970s when Margaret Thatcher first became leader of the Conservative Party in 1974, when Heath was defeated as Prime Minister. And so what she did was to set up a committee under Sir Nicholas Ridley, who was a farming squire who wore tweed suits and waistcoats and looked as thick as two short planks, sounded even thicker, and was one of the cleverest minds I ever, ever had the honour to know. He set up that committee and, while in opposition, managed to nudge the Central Electricity Generating Board, then nationalised, into choosing Dinorwig as the location for a load equalisation station, where you have a huge hollowed out mountain with a big four bay lake at the top, turbine in the middle and a big lake at the bottom to catch the water when it flows through. So when you get your peak demand, and that was the time when the most coal was being burnt in terrible old-fashioned power stations that had to be kept on spinning reserve in case that happened, they could instead just flick a switch, water would come rushing down the mountain and turn the turbines and equalise the whole grid, and then you could slowly pump it back up again overnight when grid demand was small. We had to have it at De Norwig in Wales and not on the only other appropriate site, which was Ben Cruachan in Scotland, because De Norwig was only 100 miles from the SAS lines at Hereford, and therefore I got my mates to go and do exercises all round there so that the Russians got nowhere there near while it was being built. But we also had to conceal the fact that De Norwig really mattered to any future miners' strike. So the Ridley Committee, and I wish I'd thought of this because it's the cleverest idea I've heard in a long time, decided to advertise it. And there were adverts before the film in each movie. And uh, there was a, a, an outfit called Pearl and Dean. And those of you who are as ancient as me will remember the ghastly jingle, pa 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 at the beginning of the Pearl and Dean adverts. And there was a whole Pearl and Dean advert devoted to the building of this load equalization station we didn't say quite where it was. It was shown being built at night. And uh, there was a rather vague explanation of what it did. But because we advertised it, the KGB, we've seen their reports on this, actually thought that it was harmless. They didn't realize that that would be part of our strategy for breaking the strike. Likewise, the Ridley Committee uh, negotiated with the port of Felixstowe to put in very quietly coal bunkering facilities, that you couldn't see were coal bunkering facilities. And I had good contacts with Solidarność, the union under Lech Wałęsa, which was against communism. 
and so we were able to arrange that Poland would supply whatever coal we needed if we couldn't get it from our own mines and it would be shipped in through Felixstowe, which was conveniently arranged to be a non-union port so the unions couldn't use their, contact, their communist contacts there to, to shut us down. So there, there were a number of very careful preparations like this. While the Conservatives were in opposition, they were working really hard on that Ridley Committee at doing this. And then when the strike came on, we knew it was going to because Pacepa had come out and told us. And we knew that it was going to start in 1983 and then it got put back a year. So we were very fully prepared. And when the strike started, the one base that we hadn't yet covered was how to tell the individual working miners, and I knew quite a few of them, and I, and both in Wales and in Yorkshire, and I knew that they were basically, that you couldn't get anybody more loyal to their country than the miners, even though they would strike against it because they were also loyal to their union. Now, we had to make sure that their loyalty to their country, which was very strong, prevailed over what one might call the tribal loyalty that they felt they had to uh, to the Union. And the way we did that was to find a way, and this was my job to work out how to do it, of telling them that Scargill was a Moscow line communist who had been trained in Moscow actually in 1979. In late 1979 he sailed on a Polish freighter from Tilbury to what was still then Leningrad. He took a sealed train from there, like Lenin before him, was met by the communists in Moscow, like Lenin before him, and was taken first to the Patrice Lumumba University of Terrorism, <coughs> where he spent three weeks. His handlers realized he was a cut above your typical sort of blow-yourself-up terrorist grunt. So they transferred him to where the Jerry Adams is and the Yasser Arafats and the really top terrorist leaders were trained. That was the Lenin Institute and he spent five months there. And then in December of 1979 he took an Aeroflot plane <coughs> to Paris and then a British Airways plane to London and we had to make sure that the miners knew all that I have just told you because of course that was very highly classified information at the time. So we had to decide, do we let the miners know this, in which case the Russians will know we know it and our agents who told us this will be at risk, or do we get rid of, and I'm not going to tell you how many, but it was quite a lot of agents, get them out, which you know, was disruptive to our intelligence gathering behind the Iron Curtain, but we had to do it. And we decided in the end that it was necessary that the people, the miners, should know that they were being led by the nose by communists who had been trained and were being funded by Moscow because Pacepa told us how they were going to get the money through. So a certain Eastern European embassy, still then under the control of Moscow, was the, the vehicle, the pipeline through which money, 20 million of it that we could trace, came to the miners uh, to, to fund the strike. So we told the miners that. Now how do we tell them? Well, it was no good just putting this in the Daily Mirror because you know, nobody believes the Daily Mirror, which is the paper the miners often read in those days. But if you put it in the Times, then they wouldn't read it. But they would believe it if they knew it was in the Times. So we put it in the Times. and I then recruited a friend of the Prime Minister who was a, a very wealthy businessman who could afford to take a year off. And in his new Mercedes, he drove... 29,000 miles that year, visited every pit in Britain from Kent up to Scotland and across to Wales and individually spoke to as many miners as he could and told them what, he has, what I have just told you. And he gave them the cutting from the times in which those facts are set forth. And so I'm not telling you some terrific secret that the intelligence services don't want you to know because it was published in the Times. And as a result of that, the miners, particularly in Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire, Midlands generally, were absolutely furious. 
And our man who was going around talking to every individual miner, he, he reckoned he talked to very nearly all of them, over, and there were about 100,000 of them, over that year. Uh, he, he said, they are going to crack. And he then, at his own expense, set up the National Working Miners Committee to organize the return to work. And he took adverts at his own expense in all the major newspapers saying, come on, Arthur, give a ballot. We want a ballot on going back to work. And eventually the union cracked, had a ballot, and by then my friend and the Prime Minister's friend had spoken to enough individual <coughs> mine workers that they knew what the objective truth was and they voted to end the strike. Now I tell you this story not out of any sense of self-congratulation. The man who did this is the late David Hart, a friend of the Prime Minister. He's now merry in heaven, so I can now safely tell the story because he can come to no harm. But that is how it was done. And why does it matter? Because the next thing Pacepa told us, he was by now in the West, of course, but he was still getting information from all his mates behind the Iron Curtain who were kind of thinking of doing the same as him because the whole thing was beginning to crumble by that stage. He said, they're now going to switch the focus. They've realized that you've learned how to stop them using the trade unions as a way of messing up the Western economies. So they're going to go for the environmental movement instead, in the same way as they've already captured the campaign for nuclear disarmament, which is, was virtually their creation, but they captured it very early on. They thought, well, we can do the same with the environmental movement, and then any economic activity, the environmentalists will protest and protest and protest, and we will gradually slow the economy down. Then when global warming came along, and again Pacepa got in touch, he said, well, they've seen Hansen's paper, they've realized this is exploitable, and they're now going to redirect the environmental movement via the leaderships of it, who are very largely communist, and I've met several of them, and they are, and they are going to pretend that global warming is a disaster, and it's all the West's fault exclusively, and therefore the West must be shut down in order to, and the Anne must pay reparations, as Denmark is now doing as of last week, for its sins of emission in the past. And all of this was originally driven by Moscow and is now being driven not only by Moscow, but also by Peking, which has joined in the fun since Xi Jinping became uh, the head of the Communist Party in China. So you now have a, a totalitarian axis which includes Russia, China, and also the Middle East and oil countries. What's in it for them? Well, Mr. Biden, who is strikingly naive, has tried twice to go to Saudi Arabia saying, please could you let us have more oil so that we can be good boys and stop all the fracking in Britain, stop it all in America, and we're, we're being good about global warming and you can, you can sell us oil instead. And they said no. And he couldn't understand why, and of course the reason why is that the whole purpose of the special military massacre. Do you think for a single moment Putin cares about Ukraine? He doesn't want Ukraine. He wants the prices of the commodities that he sells, the nickel, the chromium, the cobalt, the lithium that goes into every electric buggy's battery and all the grain that everybody needs. 15% of that comes from Russia, 10% from Ukraine. He wanted those prices to go up and that's why he had to make sure, via the environmental movement, that particularly the sappy European Union, which is to a very striking degree, uh, has long been under the thumb of the Kremlin, would close down the coal-fired power stations, remove the competition from Russian gas, so that then, if he ever wished to invade Europe and send all the commodity prices sky high, he could, because there was only one thing that could possibly have stopped him. And that was if we had allowed Ukraine, as we have allowed Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, and several other countries, to join NATO. Had we done that, he would not have dared to invade. He would not have been able to, to do his pretend war, push up the commodity prices, and make a lot of money. Now, what's he gonna do with the money? Well, the first thing he's doing, because it's actually, it's more than paying for itself, 
this war in Ukraine. But you won't have seen this reported in any mainstream news media. He wanted to push those commodity prices up because Putin realised after the 2008 financial crash and the response of it by the West, which was to print money, thereby building inflation into the system, which would eventually pop up somewhere. This is something that von Mises was always warning against. He realised that the West was, was going to inflate itself very badly out of business when the thing eventually hit the buffers and you had to start the reckoning. So what he wanted to do was to make so much money in just two years of war, and he reckoned, we reckon it'll take another year from now, and he will have made so much money because of the elevated commodity prices that were the foreseeable and now real consequences. Of, I'm not talking just elevated, tenfold increases in the price of things like cobalt. Really big increases. Tenfold increases in the price of the gas for the steelworks that Mr. <coughs> Mittal is having to close down. Very big increases. That will allow Putin, who has a pathological fear of government debt, to pay that debt down completely. He has already halved Russia's debt in the period up until the beginning of the special military massacre. He's now going to eradicate it altogether. It's only 25%. It's one of the lowest percentages of annual GDP of any national debt in a reasonably serious country. And he's going to eradicate that in just 12 months. Now what he can then afford to do is to compete with China for the transfer of all the heavy manufacturing industries that can no longer afford to do business in the West. You will see ArcelorMittal and other country, companies like that already being quietly wooed by Russian agents, moving their businesses there. Because we too, when I was at Turn Downing Street, were planning to get rid of the national debt. Had Margaret Thatcher stayed another four years, the way we were running the economy, the national debt would have been gone and we were going to abolish income tax because there was no need for it. And unfortunately, the wets intervened and it didn't happen. And look at the mess we're in now because we didn't watch out for borrowing. Now, the Chinese use a different economic model. They go, like the West, for very high borrowing. I'm going to give you one example of that and then I must wind up. And this example is the railways, the high-speed railway network, which is very extensive right across China and up into Lhasa in occupied Tibet. Now, they built that on borrowed money. And the entire annual ticket <coughs> revenue for the entire Chinese rapid transit railway network does not even meet the interest payments on the debt that China accumulated in order to build that network. So what are they doing? They must realise that that's not a sustainable future. They've been quietly going around the world, buying up pretty well all the deposits of lithium they can get their hands on. They now control 90% of all lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide uh, extraction and supply throughout the world. The market is denominated in yuan. And it was 70% only three years ago. But then, with China's assistance, the Taliban retook Afghanistan, having, and China <coughs> told Biden, just move your people out because we're moving in. And he said, yes, sir, and did, putting them gravely at risk and, of course, now making the Afghans live once again under this terrible, grim dictatorship. And in a reward for that, the Chinese were given control of the vast lithium fields in Afghanistan, which are the largest such deposits anywhere in the world. Afghanistan is the lithium Saudi Arabia, just as Saudi Arabia is to oil, Afghanistan is to lithium. China now controls that. So now you can see the reason for all these peculiarities that I showed you in the physics and the economics. That economic calculation, which depends on only three unimpeachable mid-range mainstream pieces of data, is unimpunable. There is no way of very greatly altering the numbers you do when you do that calculation. And they have been desperate 
to make sure that nobody tells you any of this, which is why when time and again, when I said, I bet you haven't seen this fact, that fact, or the other fact reported in any mainstream news medium, practically none of you had. This is not because you don't care about current affairs. It is because through the most ruthless, well-organized and unfortunately successful campaign of psychological warfare over a period of decades that has ever been waged against the West. Western governments have tumbled into this stupidity and have not asked the very elementary questions that pretty well answer themselves as long as you have the independence of mind and independence of thought and freedom to think and freedom to research and freedom to publish and freedom to speech, to speak, <coughs> which the left time and time again, including here in Oxford and at Cambridge, are trying to stifle. <coughs> it's a very big problem that we face, this problem of resurgent but invisible communism. It now calls itself woke because they know the word communist polls negatively. But it won't be long before even the word communist won't poll negatively anymore as the Western economies implode under the catastrophic effect of damaging the free market in energy supply, which has been the principal focus of Soviet and more recently um, Chinese policy towards the West. Now you may say, but Putin, I mean, the, you know, the Berlin Wall fell in 1990. Yes, it did. But in 2000, Putin mounted a silent coup against his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin, who went away on holiday and came back and was arrested, was taken to Putin, who said, sign this document transferring all power to me and I will let you go to your dacha and drink yourself to death. If you don't sign it, you'll go straight to the um, Lubyanka and you can drink yourself to death there. That's the choice. So Yeltsin fumbled for his pen and signed. Within three years, according to Pachepa, who is still, or was until two years ago when he sadly died, um, one of the major sources for our intelligence on all this, they were going to shut us down by continuing this campaign. They call it maskirovka. That's what they call psychological, maskirovka. It's deception pursued in an organized fashion and persisted in over time in the pursuit of the objectives of warfare against an opponent. They call it maskirovka. The particular kind of maskirovka they use, of course, was desinformatia. It was attacking the reputation of people like me. I've had it done to me. I'm regarded as a very serious threat by these wretches because I give people this kind of information. And this is why your society is so very important indeed. You are the frontline troops in the battle to restore the freedom of thought and speech and action and above all of markets for which von Mises and the new Austrian school so passionately argued throughout their working lives. It is very important therefore that you should know what I have just told you so that you can go and verify it for yourself. I do not ask you to believe. That is what men of faith do. Faith has its place, but it has no place in science. And it was Al-Haytham, the Newton of the East in 11th century Iraq, who wrote that the seeker after truth, and that is what he called a scientist, the seeker after truth, not a peddler or reciter of propaganda, but a seeker after truth, does not put his faith in any mere consensus, however widespread, however venerable, however apparently plausible. Instead, he subjects what he has learnt to it, of it to scrutiny and investigation and verification and checking and checking and checking again. The road to the truth, said al Haytham is the road we must follow. It is long and hard, but follow it we must. Thank you.